I'd like to welcome on stage uh, Franca, Francois Massot, I hope it's okay, with the, the talk, Building a Distributed Search Engine for Logs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm very happy that you are still here for this presentation, it's a little bit late. Uh, so thank you for staying uh, with us and with me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, how to build a search engine in Rust. So maybe you, you know Elasticsearch, I guess. So we are trying at QuickQuit to f build a search engine that is better, stronger, faster than Elasticsearch, at least for logs. Uh, just a short intro on me and on what we are doing at QuickQuit. So I'm a co-founder on QuickQuit. I started, uh, we started almost two years ago. I'm quite new in Rust. So if you hear some uh, wrong things on Rust, uh, raise your hands. Uh, I will give you, <laughs> you will be able to speak. Um, what we are doing, as I said, is we are building uh, an open source search engine for logs, but we are also doing other things. We are, we are publishing other crates like TonTV, which is the search library. It's not the distributed part. It's only the library with the data structures with, that are materialized on the disk, the in-memory data structure too. We are also working on ChitChat. This is a gossip protocol for uh, forming a cluster between nodes. And uh, we are also uh, working on bitpacking, on the crate bitpacking, which has uh, SIMD instructions. And uh, hopefully we will publish more crates because we love open source, we love REST, and of course search. Okay, so the agenda today is first I will explain you briefly what a search engine is and what a distributed search engine is. Then I will uh, explain you what uh, is specific for logs and uh, what, uh, how can we use these specificities to make something more efficient. I will show you how we built it in QuickWit. And then at the end, I will uh, give you a feedback about uh, our development in Rust uh, during these two years. So first, let's see what a search engine is. Uh, forget the distributed part for, for a moment. We are working only on one machine. And basically all search engines are like this. You have a bunch of documents in input. Then you, your engine will process it and will create a data structure on the disk called the inverted index. This is basically a dictionary of terms that points to the list of documents that includes this term. This is for the write path and on the read path a user will send you a query, your engine will parse it, we will analyze words that you are querying and then we'll query the data structure, the inverted index and we'll use that to return the matching documents. And that's it. This is the, wo the work for, of TonTV, actually. And it's pretty straightforward to do it in Rust. So I will just show you two functions. One function to index documents and one function to search documents. So first things to index documents. In TonTV, you have to create a schema. It's at, from the beginning, from the start, it's, uh, it's not schemaless. You have to, de to define each field that you want to index. So here I took an example with a title field, which is text, and you want also to store the content. Um, uh, Ton TV supports integers, floats, and other types of fields. Uh, we It supports also a JSON field, where you may want to index some unstructured data. To index it, you have first to create uh, index and you just have to need you just need to give your sh the schema and the uh, directory path and that's all and then 
you create an index writer. I will explain you what, what, what is this value, this big value here, uh, just after. And then you use this index writer to add a document in it. And once you did it, it's not searchable yet. So if TV is working like this, you need, you need to commit to materialize on the disk the inverted index. Without that, it's not searchable. On the read path, it's pretty simple too. You open a directory and it will find the inverted index on it. And then you define your query, for example, C whale, and you give it to the searcher. So it's, it's super easy to, to do that in Tone TV. But I need to explain you a bit more about the data structure because it's just a declarative way to, <laughs> to work with Tone TV. But behind the scenes, when you materialize the inverting index on the disk, we need to be very efficient and very compact. So I will explain you how we can do that. So as I told you, the inverting index is just a, a dictionary of terms that points to posting list. And for each term, we have this sorting list of doc IDs. So the way to be very efficient on this is to have two data structures, one for uh, store one for searching uh, very fast the terms and uh, this is I will explain just after we uh, use some kind of try for that and then we need also an efficient uh, data structure for this posting list that can be very uh, huge and contains a huge, a huge list of integers uh, the integers or uh, unsigned uh, 32 integers so for the term dictionary, so I, I told you it was a, a, a data structure uh, from the try family. It's to to be accurate. It's a finite state transducer. Transducer. So I won't explain you what it is uh, because I don't really understand how it works internally. But basically, it's like a try, but it shares both suffix prefixes and suffixes. So you will have a term and you will split into each character and then you will create this, uh, this tree. The benefit from using a finite state tra transistor compared to um, a try is just that you, you are sharing the suffixes. So it's a little bit more compact than a try. Why not using a hash map for, for that? The reason is quite simple. When you are doing full text search, you are you like being able to do some more complex queries like regex and Levenstein query. And it happens that uh, regex can be a uh, Levenstein query can uh, can be uh, imp implemented as an automaton, and you can use this automaton to uh, uh, to to, oh, yeah, to process very fast. Uh, the data structure, the FST data structure. So it's very, it's very, very fast. I encourage you to, to read the blog post from Ben Sushi because it, it, it will be way more clear than my explanation. So that's for the term dictionary. So I told you that there, there was a second data structure, which is the posting list. So the posting list, it's, uh, it's an efficient. It must be efficient for processing typically uh, Boolean queries. I put an example at the at the bottom uh, left bottom of the page, where typically for an intersection query, you will start. You will first start uh, with one point pointer uh, from the in, in the smallest list, so that you can advance very fast, and then you will compare compare the doc IDs between the the two, the two list, and you will be able to advance uh, very fast on it. So it's very, very powerful for Boolean queries. And we are, the other thing that, that is really important in posting list is compression, because you have this huge list of integers. And to compress it, it's very efficient to do it with delta encoding. So you just subtract the integers between them. 
and so you can you gain first a lot of space and then you you use bit packing to uh, to save space again uh, i won't uh, go into the details here because i won't have the time to to present you the distributed part which is the main subject of the talk so i wanted you to have a, an overview of the different data structure that will be useful after So that's nice. We have added document with Tom TV. We have committed them. It creates. Excuse me. I never receive calls. I don't. Maybe someone is calling here. I don't know. Um, so it's nice. We have added document to 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 Tom TV. We have committed it. We have our inverted index on the disk. But this structure is. Is is very efficient, very compact, but it's immutable. So what happens if you want if you want to add new documents? What we will do is incremental indexes. Is that we will generate another inverted index. We will add documents. We will commit it, commit again, and this will generate another inverted index on the disk, and that's all. And by doing that, we will you can you can continue like this and produce many 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 segments. One thing that uh, TonTV allows us is to specify a budget. That's why you you saw that in the in the code before, like it it was a 50 megabytes budget. So TonTV will use that, and once it reaches this budget, it will flush on the disk a segment. So you can index like terabytes of data with a small machines. Um, one drawback of that is that you can end up with many many segments. And in this case, you can you can merge them. So you will take a bunch of segments and read all the term dictionaries, posting list, merge them. It will be mo more efficient because you will share all the terms between all the segments. Uh, also, on the posting list, you will be it will be more. You will gain space because uh, you will have more consecutive uh, doc IDs, and the delta encoding will be better. And the compression will be even better. So it's very interesting, of course, to merge them. If you use, if you make a query on TonTV, he will just make a query on each piece of index on on each segment. So you can, if you want, you can parallelize based on on one machine. Okay. So what about the distributing search? So we were talking about searching on one machine, that's cool, but we want something bigger, of course. The common architecture for that is called the shared nothing architecture. This is used by, by main databases that you, you probably know. Uh, Cassandra is one example, Elasticsearch is one example. So what is shared nothing? Shared nothing is, is, say, is saying, that your data must be next to your CPU, so that you do the heavy lifting there, and you do it very fast because your data is next to the CPU. And to scale this, it's pretty simple. If you want to to add documents, to if you want more more documents, you shard your data, and as soon as you uh, may, may, as soon as you add more documents, you will just add shards, and each instance will be responsible for its list of shards. If you want, uh, if you have more queries that coming, what are coming into your uh, your cluster, you will just uh, add a replica to to cope with uh, the throughput. Pretty straightforward. For one, you just copy copy the data from one machine to another. It's nice also to have a replica for durability, of course. So we advise you to <laughs> to have some replica, of course. Um, and that's it. That's the basic idea of shared nothing architecture. And Elasticsearch is like this. Let's look at what's happened when we make a, a search query. So a user query, uh, a user will make a query. Uh, to it will uh, it will be processed by one node. We will call this node the root node because this this root node will be 
responsible for distributing the workload on all the shards because uh, the shards are basically a piece of index and so when you receive a query you want to execute it on every shard. So this root node will send the query to each node, to each shard. Each shard will answer, will give a, will, will uh, return the results and the root node will uh, aggregate them and return the result to the user. And so it's very fast because your data is next to the CPU, so you, it, it, it works well. On the indexing pass, what's happening? It's a little bit more complex there. So a user will send some documents, and then you will have like this kind of push ingest API that will look at this document and define where this document should be indexed. This is the routing part. So in Elasticsearch, it's to, it takes a, a, UI, a hash of a document ID to determine in, on which chart this document should be indexed. So what will happen is that once, once the, the node that receives the document knows on which shard this document should be indexed, I mean the primary shard, it will send it to the primary. This primary shard will index it, and then we'll send the document to the replica, one or several replicas. And that's it. There is one immediate, down, immediate downside here, is that you need to index several times one document. So for logs, it's not very, it can, it can be a problem, typically, because you have a huge amount of documents and you don't treat them often. So it's not very efficient to, to index uh, twice men or three times the same document. Okay, so I sh just showed you uh, how a distributed search engine works. It's an overview, of course. <laughs> and uh, now I will explain you why log search, why logs data is very, it can be very specific and can help us to uh, to change this architecture. First, logs are immutable, or if you prefer, append only. You send it to your search engine and you will not modify them. You don't need search quality. Generally, when you search for logs, you search like an error message, keywords, a, 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 an ID, a user ID to find what's up, what happened for this ID, which bugs happen. Um, you have a gigantic volume of, of data. We, we have uh, users of QuickWit that like have hundreds of terabytes per day that are coming uh, and they, they, they have to process it. And paradoxically, you have a gigantic vol volume, but uh, it's, it's highly probable that you will never search a log inside of them. So indexing logs uh, can, is not an obvious uh, response to that. Because if you never search logs, why paying the cost of indexing them? And this is what Loki, uh, I guess you know what Loki is. It's, it's a, a software from Grafana. And they decided to not index logs. They are just putting some chunks of data. So they, they use some metadata to filter uh, through, through the logs, but they don't index the text because it's costly and there is a high probability that you never will never search this piece of logs. Uh, one cool thing about logs is that users generally are okay to wait a bit. It's like for analytics stuff. You can wait one second. It's not the case if you if you are on Amazon uh, uh, website where you want like uh, a query response uh, under a few milliseconds. And if you if you lose ten milliseconds, you lose clients and you lose a lot of money, of course. So you don't want that for uh, for e-commerce search typically, but for logs, that's okay. And the last part, it's multi-tenancy or multi-index. It's the fact that. You may want to create 
to isolate different indexes and uh, typically for security reasons or because you have different clients and you want to isolate their data so you will separate it so these different criteria can help us define a, b a better way to to search for logs and so now i will explain how we did it but first i, I will uh, Quote Datadog. I guess you know Datadog because they are they are processing a lot, <laughs> lot of logs. Uh, I can't imagine the number of petabytes they are processing anyway. But they they use, they started with Elasticsearch, and what they saw is it, is that the multi tenancy was a, a big problem for them because one tenant. I don't know if you remember the share nothing architecture. But if you have one tenant that is have a lot, a huge amount of logs that is in incoming, it will overload many servers and it will impact the query, the the, qu the query side too, and the other tenants of course. So they decided to to change uh, and go from a shared uh, nothing architecture to the shared disk architecture. This blog post was uh, posted a uh, few months ago, and it happened that we, coincidence or not, we don't know, but we we started with this idea of going from the shared uh, nothing architecture to the shared disk architecture. The shared disk architecture, we we did not invent anything. It's uh, it's pretty well known in the analytics world. So Snowflake is the big example, the big success. They they choose this architecture to. To, to, to make analytics uh, processing more efficient. So let's see how we do that in quick wit. So what is shared disk architecture? It's just simply your storage is not next to your CPU. It's far from, it's far away. So what's happening on the read path? So you have still a user that is making a query. Same thing, we have a root node that is receiving this query and we will distribute the, the query on the different nodes. But this time, it will first query what we called in, in QuickWit a uh, metastore. So here we are using today PostgreSQL, but it would be another, engine, uh, another store engine. So PostgreSQL st is storing some metadata and typically it is storing the metadata of each piece of index that we have uh, that we have for this query. So it could be, we, we are calling this splits. It's like a segment, the segment that uh, I told you about before. And, and the metastore will say, okay, you need to search through 100 pieces of index, 100 splits. And the root node will say, okay, we need to search through this 100 splits. And I will spread the, the load on all the leaf, on the leaves. And each leaf node will receive this, uh, this leaf query, and will just take care about uh, uh, these splits and will fetch the data from the object storage, will process it on the leaf, and will return the result to the root node. So basically, it's almost the same, so uh, unless we have uh, this meta store and we are paying a latency to fetch this data because uh, I, I will show you afterwards, but uh, the latency can be quite big on object storage. The good thing here, for us at least, is that we are storing data on an object storage uh, like S3, so it's very reliable, durable, so we, we can clearly sleep at night, we won't lose your data. And I'm very happy with that because and we are using also PostgreSQL, so it's battle tested. So uh, I, li I like when I, I can sleep at night and I'm not uh, awakened by some some bugs uh, <laughs> that I need to solve. So it's really cool and it's cheap. Another cool cool thing here is that every node can answer any query. It was not the case uh, with a shard nothing architecture. When you are on a shard, the query uh, it concerns this shard of data, and that's that's it. So for distributing the workload, it's really efficient. 
And another nice thing is that you can add or remove nodes very fast because you don't need to replicate data to move the data to this machine. So on the right path, so still you have a user that is sending a document. We we have a push API in Quickwit, but uh, I won't talk about that today because it's not as uh, as good as uh, the distributed queues that we are using. For Quick in Quickwit, we are relying on Kafka or Kinesis or any distributed queues like this to fetch uh, the documents from, uh, sent by the user. It's very nice because you, we benefit from um, the, um, the way Kafka is handling or uh, spreading the load. So you benefit from partitioning. So you can your system can scale. And you benefit from also offsets. So you know if you you know exactly if you have processed an uh, a message or not. So you are we are retrieving these offsets and saving them in our meta store. So we know exactly which message has been processed or not. So it's really cool because we 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 can ensure exactly once semantics. So the quick quit indexing node will fetch the data from Kafka, will index it, so create this inverted index, and will upload this index on the object storage. And once it's, if the upload is uh, succeeded, it will publish the metadata of a small piece on the Metastore. And that's it. Once it's published, the searchers can query it. And that's it. So the nice part here, I, I did not show that, but is that you can scale uh, scale uh, scale things very easily with uh, Kafka. Uh, you have uh, this concept of consumer groups in Kafka, and so if we add some nodes, we are using con consu Kafka consumers that will handle each one will handle a unique set of partitions of your Kafka topic. So it's really cool because you can you, you can pop uh, like 100 index if you want. So to, sum to summarize things, uh, oh yes, I forgot something here. The nice thing is that we index only once. Once it's indexed, we upload it to the shared storage, and that's it. We don't need to index it twice because we rely on battle testing technology like uh, like S3. So it's obviously cheaper for the storage. We, as I told you, I'm very happy to delegate things to battle-tested technologies. Um, super easy to scale up, scale down. Multi-tenancy is also ensured because we, we can separate indexes. Each node can handle any queries of any index, so that's not a problem. And the problems now that we need to solve is that we, we are paying a high penalty with latency. Compared to an SSD, like an SSD is under one millisecond when you make a seek. Uh, for Amazon S3, it's like it's around 70 milliseconds, maybe 60 milliseconds. And the throughput is very bad too. So we need to solve that. The time to search is also not very good because you need to wait to publish your data to the Metastore and to, to upload, upload the data to the object storage. So you need to wait a bit. And of course, there's no mutability. So deletion is uh, much harder to handle. So let's solve this, uh, these challenges together. <laughs> First, uh, staying truly stateless. Um, as I told you, you can have many index. Every node should answer any queries. So you need to be able to what we call in search open index very fast. It's the open index that I showed you uh, when uh, in, in the function that search documents in TV. This open index happens to make 28 reads, random reads. So it's so if you if 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 we use directly TV, uh, dot uh, create uh, open dir. Uh, we will need to make like 28 queries to Amazon S3, and it's really, really bad. It's and it's hard to parallelize because 
like you have every in every file from Tone TV, you will have like a small piece of data, a header, a footer, and then the header will be uh, will enable you to fetch another piece of data, and it's, it's very boring and annoying. So what we so uh, I I can uh, I can show you a bit the different files in Tone TV at least. So you have uh, the position files in uh, purple, the posting list in blue, uh, in r in in gr in, uh, in green. It's the store, the data store. It's the it's where you we store the documents. Uh, the fast field is a columnar storage, and the term dictionary is a little bit. Uh, it's it's quite small on this example. So have you you have this bunch of files, and it's it's a TV segment is just this this set of files, and that that's it. So what we did for QuickWit is just we we put in a hot cache, in, in sort of mini cache, all this small piece of data, the, these twenty eight reads. We we put them in a small uh, hot cache piece of data that we uh, that we we will append to the split file. This split file is uh, just a concatenate, concatenated uh, file made from uh, all the Tone TV files. And in the red, in the red at the end, we add this uh, turbo cache, hot cache file with a different file offset also because what we will need after at the search time is maybe we want to retrieve uh, some piece of data in the fast field. So it's interesting to keep the offset too. So by doing that, ab just abandoning this hot cache, uh, we reduce 28 reads to one read. So we have one six, so only 17 millisecond penalty. So that's way better. Problem two is bad throughput. So as I, as I told you, it it's around 100 megabytes per second. And so what what we had to do is to basically parallelize all our I.O when it was possible. So first we we are doing we fetch this hot cache and when we fetch this hot cache we will paralyze all the uh, typically when we need to uh, when a user a user ask for two terms we will fetch in parallel the two posting lists. So I forgot to mention that we you need to make another request to take a piece of the term dictionary before and I will explain this just afterwards. So the good the good news is that when you parallelize request, it work it works very well on S3. So you, you can have a, a very nice throughput, and you have you ha you have to choose correctly your Amazon instance, of course, but uh, it works pretty well. And concerning the term dictionary, uh, it can it can be a problem because I told you about this try thing, the FST. Uh, the problem is that it's very nice to do some reg for uh, to be able to do regex queries on, the, on, on it. But the problem is that you it will generate many random six six. So what we decided is that we decided to to change to drop this FFT and drop for now the regex queries for QuickWit and use an SS table. So just a sorted uh, strings for terms, and then associate each terms with uh, the, the range by the range of sets uh, of uh, the posting list, and that's it. Okay, let me show you how it works, in, not in production, but on a Kubernetes cluster. So just to show you to check if, if the connection is working. So for now we have one searcher which is running. The Metastore is just a JRPC la layer uh, that is requesting the PostgreSQL. Um, so with that, I indexed uh, a data set. Uh, can you see? No, not very good. So we have embedded a small user interface. Uh, so I have a, I have um, cool. thanks. Um, what I did is I indexed uh, the data, GitHub archive datasets. I don't know if you you know this dataset. It's just the 
uh, events from uh, GitHub. So like commit, pull request, every comments, uh, stars, and everything like this. So it's a, it's quite a huge, uh, several terabytes. I did not have the time to index everything because I started uh, indexing yesterday, sorry. Um, but there is a bunch of document inside of it. So here I'm correctly, I'm directly co connected to the searcher that you saw uh, in, in, the, in the list of pods. Uh, so this, um, okay, there is a bug in the user interface, uh, I guess. Oh, size of privilege split, no. So we have 128 splits, so the, the pieces of index. Uh, we have 1 billion point six documents, and the size is uh, uh, is 275 uh, gigabytes. So I I would have preferred to show you some like terabytes, but I did, sorry, I did not have the time to. Anyway, and here you can see that uh, it's where the data is stored. So uh, we we have separated compute and storage, <laughs> and. Now we can make a query. So here it's uh, like uh, I will catch all. It will. So what's happening is that I send a user uh, a query to the searcher, and it will uh, spread the load on all the searchers. But there is only one, so it, it will handle the search of each split. So here it took five seconds for that. So what can what can I can show you is just that. Let's. Um, uh, oh yes, is this? Uh, sorry, I lost the command. Okay, this one. So let's scale the searcher like to four replica. So you will see. Okay. The, uh, the the new the new replica are uh, here. We have the initial one, and now we we have four searches. Uh, we need to wait a little bit, uh, a few seconds, uh, before uh, the cluster is aware of every new node. So we are using chit chat for that, by the way. And so now, in theory, <laughs> we should divide by three, some some uh, something around by three, the the time to search, the the search response. Sorry. Okay, so now I need to redo these things. I need that. Uh, okay, it's long. <laughs> okay, four seconds. Maybe I need to refer to launch again. So what, what? Normally, the second time it's faster because we we are caching the, the, the hot cache, the little piece of data we added to the split. So of course we can do whatever query we want. And so now we have something like, like hopefully it will be under one second, which is the promise of QuickWit <laughs> to be able to query under, under one second. And so we can, uh, of course, uh, Scale down and see that uh, the, the, the search time will uh, will uh, decrease. And I will do that. So this is the demonstration for um, searches. Uh, I can show you also the indexer part. So I need to create uh, them. Uh, let's see how many indexers that I've created. Okay, so I have one indexer. So to, to know what what an indexer is doing, uh, we don't have a, a user interface for that, but we use Prometheus, so normally we, we will be able to see something here. Uh, so we just publish a bunch of metrics on, on the new endpoint. So yes, we have 
we are starting to see, to see some throughput here. So it's it's uh, what I'm showing is just the, num the number of uh, of ingested bytes. So let's wait. Okay. So now, normally, we, you should expect uh, some, something around 40 megabytes per second or 50 megabytes per second, depends on the, the schema of your index, uh, the type of documents, of course. So this is fine. And what we can do is uh, also to scale them. Like we could. And normally, uh, the Kafka consumer will do their job and fetch their own partitions, and it will scale like smoothly, uh, like uh, like in theory. So we need to wait so that we can. Basically, what I observed on these machines that uh, it's it's lin linear. If you have four indexers, you will have four times the throughput of one. Uh, but here we are clearly benefiting from uh, Kafka because we we don't have fancy stuff on the Cookwit side. Don't have to, we don't use Raft currently. Uh, we don't have uh, this kind of stuff. Okay, um, so that's for the, the demo part. Uh, and maybe I need to come back here. So what we observe with our current user is that. Like uh, like I said, uh, the throughput for one indexer is like something around 40 megabytes. And uh, we also uh, observe some nice experimentation with uh, many indexers with a throughput of one gigabyte per second. So it, it's working pretty well, so that's cool. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, I'm sorry, so as, a, as the data set is a little bit small, uh, we we made uh, an uh, an example last year on searching through one billion page. So here we have one or two terabytes of data, and uh, you can play uh, with it. So you you can see it's, it's the common call data set, and uh, it's basically a snapshot of the web. Uh, obviously, uh, not all the pages, but uh, it's interesting. All right, um, how many? Is how many do, do I have? Ten. Oh shit. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I want to finish on, on this because for me it was the most interesting part on on the Rust side. Um, it's what I learned and what the team learned uh, with these two years of development. And one thing that on which we struggled was uh, modeling the, our pipeline execution pipeline. So to, and the indexing pipeline is, is a bit tricky. So what you need to do is first, you need to fetch some data from Kafka. See, this is the source actor. And then you need to process them. Uh, like it's a JSON and you need to transform it according to your schema. And then you need to index it. So it's the add document part of TV. Then you need to serialize it on the disk. Uh, it's the role of a serializer, and the packager is the is the actor that is uh, taking all the piece, the, all the files of TomTV of the TomTV segment, and making a big split file. And the upload is just the uploader, and then the publisher is just the publisher that publishes the metadata to the metastore. And then we have the merge things, but let's not talk about that. So at the start, what we we started with uh, some code like that. So uh, for example, if you have a source, uh, we will create a receiver, uh, a sender. The source will take the sender and will send like the batch batches from Kafka and we will send to the source uh, receiver and the source receiver will give it to the next actor. And we will have down the road all this actor with a receiver and a sender. And then you use Tokyo Spawn to, uh, to just uh, run this uh, in a Tokyo task. Super cool. But the problem we had is that we wanted to know if our actor was dead or alive. We wanted to have like some kind of state from him, an observable state. Um, 
So, and then we, in certain case, in this pipeline, if there is a problem somewhere, as we want to ensure exactly semantics, we don't want to publish uh, some shit on, on uh, the metastore because this is the tr our source of truth. We, in certain ca cases, we want to kill uh, every actor. So we want to have like a button, like a kill switch to kill everyone if we see that there is a problem somewhere. So we stop all the pipeline and then we start. So all these features are uh, very boring to implement if you, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of boilerplate. And so what we have decided is uh, we, we thought it's a perfect case for an actor framework. So we had a look at the different actors framework, not all because there are many in Rust. The most famous one is Actix. Uh, there is an interesting one with, which is called Mayo, which is uh, enabled async, uh, the message, uh, some asynchronous uh, message handling. Uh, but clearly, we did not find uh, all the features that we wanted. So we use async everywhere in QuickWit, so we really need to like this async uh, handling of messages. We are also using different Tokyo road times because we have some blocking uh, CPU uh, task. And uh, it's a bit. This part is a bit tricky. We want also to schedule actions, like an actor should be able to, uh, like a supervisor, for example. If you supervise a, a, a pipeline, you want to uh, check it again in one minute, for example. So you want to schedule an action in the future that will be a, pro a processing of a message that will be executed in the future. Uh, we want also to have two. Uh, two uh, message queues, one for common messages and one for high priority. Like if you want to kill immediately an actor, you don't want to wait that the actor has, process has finished processing all the message. You want to act it immediately. We want also back pressure. Uh, as, as, as you saw, that it's just bounded. Uh, you, you just have to use bounded channels. And supervisor, of course. And uh, when we made this list, it was clear that uh, it was just easier for us to start, at least, with a, a custom uh, actor framework. So I will just show you a bit of it. So here's the actor trait. So you can see that when you implement, you can choose like the runtime. Uh, you can choose if it's bounded or unbounded, so uh, with back pressure or not, without back pressure. The thing of observable state is just uh, a way to ensure that every actor is observed. We, we can observe them. So we, the way you, to observe them is, is just to, you send a specific message, uh, it's a command observe, and it will return it, uh, like uh, this observable state uh, type. Initialize, finalize is just uh, what you execute uh, when you start an actor and when you exit. Um, the way we are using it, just you need to uh, uh, implement the a handler trait. Uh, the handler trait is not very interesting. It's just like it just has a handle, <laughs> a handle message, and and that's it. So here we, you can see that we we have this new ping receive. This is nice. For example, if you want to observe, it's very practical when you want to test your actor because uh, that was also one of our requirement: be able to test super simply uh, our actors. So I just put an example here. So here, to test an actor in QuickWit, you first create a universe. The universe will spawn, it will be responsible for spawn, spawning the actor loop. And uh, once it's, uh, once you spawn, for example, a ping receiver with name of Rust, th then you are able to say, okay, observe it. It will uh, send a one shot uh, ch channel message to the actor. And it will respond it, and then you, for example, here it's the state is just uh, the numpeg receive this integer, and then you can send a message to this actor with with this mailbox, and uh, and then you can check that uh, he has incremented correctly uh, the state. So it's super easy to to test, and we are very very happy with uh, actor this this actor framework. It's not a dedicated trade, uh, crate, but we may uh, we may open source it in a dedicated uh, crate. Uh, last thing, 
Uh, thank you, Tokyo, of course, because we use it everywhere. Uh, we we are really async await our. It was a bit hard at the beginning, but we are really enjoying it. The the, the real thing that we struggled with is uh, the different um, the way we handle blocking tasks and how we should do that. So what we end uh, ended up is like creating two uh, runtime, one runtime for uh, non-blocking task and one runtime for blocking task. Why we did that is because if you use directly spawn blocking, for example, of Tokyo, it, it, it will use many threads uh, for that. And we don't want to, to create 500 threads. So we want to, to control that. Uh, thus, the two runtimes. Um, and w one interesting story is, that I, don't, I, w I would be happy to discuss with one of you is we, we, we had some fragmentation, memory fragmentation issue. Like a user starting like using heavily quickwit, and w and we we had like uh, out of memory error uh, because the 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 quickwit Rust binary was taking more and more memories, and by just changing the default allocator allocator, we finally used gemalloc and we solved the problem. There is an interesting Reddit thread, uh, but I still don't really understand what's uh, happening there. So. I would be happy to discuss if uh, you know this problem. And uh, thank you. So thank you very much, Francois. Uh, I think we have uh, time for one or two fast questions before the um, coffee break. Under. Mm, about the uh, metadata of the file that you append at the end of the file, uh, did you think to just use a different file um, and you know say name different extensions and just up then uh, add that on the next it and any pros or cons about you know the approach with S3? Um, so, uh, good question. At the start, we. We did not create this uh, one split file, uh, but we were making too many put requests. And this ca what ha what's happening is that you're making like many, many requests. If you have a lot of indexes, lots of documents, you will make many put requests. Put requests are a little bit more expensive than get requests. So we, we decided to optimize a bit this part and just make a one immutable data file. It's also nice when you look at the what's inside your bucket, because you are just one file for one split. So for maintenance things, it's it's quite nice to have one file. And there is no reason to not make it one file. Thank you. Any other question? I think no. So thank you very much, Francois, for your presentation.